This is part 12 of rebuilding a large old twin cylinder steam engine and it's all about refitting the piston rods and the cross heads with an extra little bit at the end. The first thing to do is to remove the cylinders and put them in a safe place. And first I'm wiping away all the dust and grime that's gathered on the top of the standards over the last few weeks. From now on we need to keep the surfaces pretty clean. As I'm now going to fit the piston rod and cross head into one of the standards I do need to remove the piston. This is what I'm doing at the moment. I've undone the nut and then the piston itself is also threaded onto the piston rod. The piston unscrewed very easily from the piston rod. When I refit the piston I think I'm going to nip it up a little bit tighter by using a pair of circlip pliers on the two holes at the top of the piston. So here comes the piston rod separated from the piston and we can carry on from here. But first of all a warning. Always put the gland onto the piston rod before wrapping the piston rod in graphited yarn. This graphited yarn is some old stuff that I have that I've unpicked from a much larger piece of graphited yarn. I do find the current graphited yarn that's been supplied is not so good, so I use this old stuff and it definitely does the job. It's not quite as graphited as it should be because it's unpicked from a much larger piece. What I would normally do is once I've wrapped the graphited yarn around the piston rod, I would apply some steam oil. This serves two purposes. One, it holds the graphited yarn to the piston rod, allowing easy insertion into the cylinder, and two, it gives a head start on the lubrication. It's good to have lubrication for the first run. And it's also good to be able to wrap the graphited yarn around the piston rod when it's in this state. It's much more difficult, as you can see here, if it's fitted inside the crosshead guides. When fitting a piston rod into a gland, make sure that the graphited yarn is nowhere near the thread on the end of the piston rod. Otherwise it will be shredded by the sharp threads and will not seal properly. Do not over tighten the gland nuts. If you over tighten the gland you're going to have a problem and you will probably score the piston rod. So be careful here. A quick look now underneath the engine. The crankshaft is really looking good. So it's time to do a dummy run on assembly of one of the connecting rods. So I'm poking the connecting rod into the crosshead and then I fit the pin as you see here. This does not have the split pin in the other side, it's just pushed through to test. And now I'm going to look at the bottom end of the engine to look in detail at the way the big ends fit. On this engine generally there are a few engineering disaster areas and the big ends were one of these disaster areas. The big end bearing caps were originally held on by just a couple of slotted machine screws. This is no good at all. What I'm going to do is fit studs and lock nuts because it would be pretty disastrous if the big end came loose when the engine was running. Don't forget this is quite a big engine, two two inch bore cylinders and with 80 pounds per square inch behind these cylinders that's some power and a big end dropping off at the wrong time would cause serious damage if not total destruction to parts of the engine. Temporarily I'm using a couple of 2BA bolts to hold the bottom bearing in place. What I do notice is there is a large gap between the bottom bearing and the top bearing. That's because some fool in the past has removed far too much metal from the top bearing. So I have a couple of options open here which I will be discussing in detail in the next video. Time now to fit the piston onto the piston rod. This is just the reverse of disassembly so it's straightforward. What I'm having to do is solidly hold in place the crosshead so it can't move and then this will allow me to tighten down the piston onto the rod using a pair of circlip pliers. Then the nut in the middle is simply a lock nut and this ensures that the piston can never come loose. Time to see if the cylinder fits on top of the piston. First thing to do is clean out the cylinder because that is also full of dust and grime from being on the bench and then thoroughly lubricate the metal parts. These cylinders were originally put in a bath of cellulose thinners, so as far as grease is concerned, they are squeaky clean, not greasy at all. So now some lubrication is required to make sure that you do not prematurely wear out the piston rings. The final job with the piston rods and pistons is to do a slideability test to make sure nothing's binding as the crossheads go up and down in the crosshead guides. And it's not too bad. One of the cylinders is slightly stiffer than the other, but it will even out when it's been run. One final little job and a handy tip is to do with the slide valves. 
there is only one of these with this engine. This is the small brass part that screws onto the valve spindle and it allows adjustment of the valve and it also moves the valve up and down. So I had to make one, a very simple job, machine a piece of brass, drill a hole in it, tap it 2BA, cut it to size and shape it. This will do the trick. These brass parts must not be a tight fit in the valve. If they're a tight fit, they're likely to hold the valve off the port face. Here's a useful tip. Slide valves in a vertical plane sometimes do not slam onto the port face when steam or air is admitted. So what I do is give them a bit of a helping hand. I use a piece of silicone rubber like you can see here. What this effectively does is holds the valve against the port face. I would only do this in a collector's stationary engine though, not in every engine. Particularly on a locomotive it would not be desirable. Unless the locomotive was fitted with a snifting valve, which is a vacuum relief valve, it is advantageous for the valve to fall off the port face to stop the cylinder from vacuuming. But with a collector's engine, which is going to be largely run on compressed air and usually nowhere near the real pressure required, it is impossible to get the valves to slam back on the port face, so just for convenience this is a good idea. Normally I would machine the valve or machine the brass part and recess this into the brass part or the valve. Another simple way of holding the silicon rubber in place is to just use a dab of medium viscosity superglue. Thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.